Matthew chapter 28, 16 to 20. The 11 disciples travelled to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but some doubted. Then Jesus, coming near, said to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Going, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptising them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, We're God's mob. Uh, We say that week in, week out. Uh, We've learned over the last few weeks that we are disciples who make disciples. We've learned that disciples are wholehearted student followers of Jesus. Uh, This means we're a gospeling mob. Uh, We're a people who won't shut up about Jesus, who proclaim and practice the good news of Jesus so that others might meet him and come to know God and be forgiven by him. We're a gathering mob. Uh, We've been brought into community with God and his people. Uh, The picture of that is baptism, and we gather regularly with God and his mob. We're a growing mob. As Steve helped us learn last week, we're growing in our knowledge and love of Jesus, our new boss, as we spend time in his word with his people and by his help. We're getting used to what he's already made us. And that leaves one other part of being a disciple, a disciple who makes other disciples. We're a going mob. And we're going to think about that this morning. Let me pray and we'll dive into it together. Our Father, thank you that you've gathered us together this morning. Uh, as someone pointed out before church, uh, we're coming from so many different weeks, some from weeks which have been everything we'd hoped them to be, others out of weeks which have been quite disappointing and perhaps very hard. Uh, We're looking ahead to a week uh, that is different for each of us. I thank you that you are the same God. I thank you that you offer the same salvation. Thank you that you offer the same Lord and Saviour, Jesus, who lived for us, died for us, and rose for us so we could have life as you designed it. Father, as we think about going today, make us an intentional mob, people who look for opportunities that you create to share your good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Well, make sure you've got your passage there, Matthew chapter 28, 16 to 20. I'm going to move through some slides, a lot of Bible references, so we'll touch on some of them, but you'll at least see them up on the overhead. Uh, Let me remind you of what we're doing. Uh, We're going through Jesus' last commands. Uh, Jesus has gathered his mob together. Remember, there's only 11. They're not complete. Remember, they're doubting and they're worshipping, so they're an incomplete bunch of doubting worshippers. Not much to recommend them. And he gives them his final instruction. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Going, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptising them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'm at point two on the outline. The command of Jesus is very clear. As we've seen over the last three weeks, Jesus unpacks it in a very clear way. And today's word, going, is quite clear. Really hard to actually define it any clearer, isn't it? Uh, Everyone knows what going is. Uh, It means to move. Uh, It might mean to move out. It might mean to move away. It might mean to move across. It might mean to move too, but whatever you define it as, it's a moving word, isn't it? It involves motion. And so when Jesus unpacks the command to make disciples of all nations, what does he mean by going? It's important to remember who's speaking here. It's important to remember the authority that Jesus has. I think we can get a little complacent about this. Uh, The first disciples needed to be reassured that he really was standing there with them, didn't they? Is it really Jesus? Give me some fish to eat. Touch my hands. I think we need to be reminded. They needed to be reassured that he wasn't in the grave. We need to be reminded that he really is the Lord of the universe. Look at verse 18 again. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. They were reassured Jesus isn't in the grave. 
Not even death can beat him. We need to be reminded of that too, don't we? Jesus isn't just a good bloke. Jesus isn't just, as Ben helped us understand last week, Jesus isn't just a mentor or a life coach. Jesus is the boss of the universe. He has all authority. And when he has all that authority, he actually uses it for all other people, doesn't he? His desire and design is for people from every nation regardless of skin colour, education, background, work history, jail record, family life, all people to come to know him. His desire and design is to use all authority for the good of his enemies. His desire and design is for people to know God and so have life. When Jesus says go... He's not issuing a perhaps, a maybe, if you've had the right sensitivity training, if you possess an inclination. Jesus is saying, I'm the boss of the universe. You're my mob. Go. I think that has been really helpful for me to be reminded of this week. You see, one of the things I do, you might be a little different. One of the things that I do is that I cherry pick which of Jesus' commands I like. I like the teaching bit because I'm quite comfortable with that bit. I can handle the baptizing bit. That just involves some water. The going bit. You see, I've been reminded this week that Jesus' authority lies behind all of his commands. We can't cherry pick which one we like which one to be passionate about, which one to actually think is more important. To be a disciple of Jesus is to be a wholehearted student follower of the man who walked out of the grave, who is the Lord of the universe. But it's more than just strict obedience. It's actually how Jesus expresses who he is. And it's actually about being a wholehearted student follower. Let's go back to that reading from Philippians chapter 2. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he'd come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even at death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Did you catch what Jesus did there? Jesus expressed his godness by going. Jesus expressed his godness by emptying himself, by coming as a human being, by actually moving. He came to earth, humbled himself, became like one of us and then died on the cross. And the going of Jesus wasn't to people who would welcome him. It was to people who were sharpening their nails. The going of Jesus wasn't to his own friends. It was to his mortal enemies. The going of Jesus wasn't to his own social demographic group. It was to those who hated him. The going of Jesus had a certain regard, didn't it, for humans. And we've heard of that, haven't we? It's called grace. He looked at his enemies, he emptied himself, and he thought that their needs were more important than his And so he expressed his godness that way. Uh, That puts a whole new perspective on Jesus going, doesn't it? He wasn't just obedient. He was certainly obedient. Do you notice that in verse 8? He was obedient to death. He obeyed his father's will, Isaiah 53. He listened to what his father said and did it, but it was because he regarded his enemies as more important than himself. And they needed something because of him. 
You see, going is essential to who Jesus is. He is, if you like, in Australian language, Jesus is a goer, isn't he? And that's to be the attitude of his disciples. Did you notice verse 5? Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus. It's to have a regard for the world that is by grace, not by rights. It's to have a regard for the world that sees the needs of others. It's to have a regard for the world that doesn't say, hey, gee, Jesus did a good thing. It's to have a regard for the world that sees going as essential to grace. And in that sense, Jesus isn't asking his people to do anything more than he did, is he? Isn't that the sign of a good leader? That he actually leads by doing what he calls his people to do? Now, it's a pretty scary thing when you regard it that way, isn't it? To do that. And that's why Jesus uses his authority not just to command but to enable. If you've got your sheets there, notice what he says in the last part of Matthew 28. Remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's not as if Jesus gives a command and then shuts the throne room and leaves us to go and work out how to do it. Jesus actually reassures his people. He exercises his authority And then he enables his people to obey him, doesn't he? The very same authority that lies behind the command is the same authority that equips God's people, encourages God's people, emboldens God's people, enables incomplete doubting worshippers to go. Just open the book of Acts. You meet a bunch of people who are waiting, don't you? And then Jesus does what he says, and off they go, don't they? Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Well, at least Jerusalem at that point. Jesus' power and authority lies behind his command, but also behind his equipping. Jesus issues a command and then enables his people. It's not an empty promise. It's not a placebo. It's not a psychological ploy. It's actually the real presence of God himself with his people, enabling them to proclaim and practice. And it's not plan B. It's not plan B. It's not as if Jesus got to earth and went, oh, strike, Uh, the job description God gave me doesn't work down here. I need to come up with something new. Now, Now, the whole idea of going is actually part of God's habit and design. Right from the very beginning, God is doing this. Is that going to go to the next slide? Right there in the first chapter of the Bible, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and what? Go. Get out into the world. Fill the world and represent me. It's part of God's design for people to be going. Uh, when we get to that great moment where humans decide they, they can do better than God, what, what does God do in Genesis chapter 3? Uh, he actually goes, doesn't he? Comes into the garden and walks with Adam and Eve, well, at least confronts them, goes to find the people who've rebelled against him. Uh, when you get to Genesis chapter 11 and you find that the humans don't want to go into the world, what does God do? And God scatters them out so they can actually do the job that he created them to do. Uh, When we get to the end of something like Isaiah 66, where God has a magnificent image of what the end of the world will be like, uh, you've got going there. God gathers all of his people so they can meet Jesus and then he kicks them out into the world so that they'll actually tell the world of him. It's there at the start of John's account of Jesus' life, that Jesus came and lived amongst humans. And then we get to that one there in Acts where they've gathered in Jerusalem, they've been equipped and they won't go out. And so what does God do yet again? He scatters them out into the world so that they can do their job. The habit and design of God is always going, going to find those who won't come to him, going to meet his enemies because their needs are greater. So as we come to the end of this summary, how would you define going? 
as part of Jesus' command. Well, going's a movement, isn't it? It's a motion word, a movement to, across, into, away from, to make a disciple. In that sense, it's movement that's intentional. It's movement that's intentional. It's intentional because it's obedience. The Lord of the universe has commanded his disciples to go and represent him to the world. It's an obedience that is wholehearted and developing. It's an obedience that's logical. I mean, how else is the world going to know about Jesus if people don't go and talk about him? How else are neighbours and nations and other language tongues going to meet Jesus if disciples don't go? Uh, It's an intentional going that's driven by grace, the very same grace that's at the heart of what Jesus did. It goes to people who don't like you. It goes to enemies that will hate you. It goes to rebels who are plotting your death. It goes to image bearers who think they are better than you. It goes to the different and the unlovely. It goes to those who need mercy and grace. Disciples are no different, are they? Their intentional going is driven by grace. And because of that, it'll be costly. Did you pick that up in that Philippians passage? Can you imagine the cost of expressing your godness by giving up everything? Can you imagine the cost of declaring to the world that you're no longer the boss, but Jesus is? Can you imagine the cost to going into the world and actually saying to the world, you need help? Can you imagine the cost of saying to the world that it is under judgment and it needs a Lord and Saviour? Can you imagine the cost of being a wholehearted student follower of Jesus? It's an intentional going that is confident and courageous. After all, Jesus has already done it and he's promised to be with us as we do it, as we take this good news about him and tell it to the world. And finally, it's an intentional going that's local, national, and global. Did you notice who Jesus said to make disciples of? All nations, all peoples. It's necessarily global. And the logic is clear. God made the world. The world rejected God. God promised to restore the world. How's he going to do that? Through the king of the world. How's the world going to know that? By the disciples going out. So there's no national, cultural, ethnic or geographical border that stops this going. None at all. It's national. God's concerned for people of which nation? Every nation. Which ethnic group? Every ethnic group. Which heart lung language? Every heart language. And it's local. We're going to go out of the building, aren't we? We're going to go home. We're going to go to Woolies. We're going to work. We're going to touch football tomorrow night. We're going to the gym this week, maybe. We're always going, aren't we? Is our going intentional? So let me just push a little further before I finish. If going is a matter of obedience, are we going? And if we're not going, why might we not be going? Is it because we feel ill-equipped? We don't have the right words? Or is it because we think the cost is too high? And there is too much at stake if we follow Jesus wholeheartedly. If going is a matter of grace, are we known as a people of grace? People who look at the world not through standards, not through family trees, not through any other performance indicator but through grace that Jesus Christ came for all. If going's costly, how do we regard that cost? It might not be financial, it might be reputational. 
It might be relational. It might be status. It might be image. It might even be long-cherished dreams and desires for the good news of Jesus. If going can be done in confidence, are we actually confident that Jesus is with us? That he can do what he promises? If going is local, national and global, have we thought about our going? Where do we go in our town to make disciples? Is our gym membership intentional? Is our shopping locational intentional? Are our relationships a part of going? Is there any part of our town that we think is too hard, too poor or too wealthy? Is there any ethnic group or geographical area we might think is impossible? Is there a way we can use our prosperity so others can go? Is there an opportunity to meet with others to pray? Perhaps with that small group of people who meet every Tuesday at 12 o'clock to pray for Aboriginal Australia and in our town. Is there a possibility and an opportunity to get together as a group and to go and perhaps start a new gathering in our town, in a part of town where people need to hear about Jesus? We've come to the end of our series. We've looked at who we are, disciple-making disciples, gospel and gathering, growing and going. We're wholehearted student followers of Jesus and desire others to become disciples by meeting Jesus. If we put all of that into practice, we're going to be really busy, aren't we? In fact, if you're anything like me, you could be so busy that you end up being focused on who? On me. On what I'm doing. We could become a mob that is so focused on what we do as disciples that we forget why we're disciples. And so I want to finish by just turning back and reading Philippians 2. Listen carefully. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he'd come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even a death on a cross. For this reason, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you notice who's not mentioned there? Do you notice we're not mentioned there outside verse 5? Do you notice that puts a whole spin on why Jesus came? Do you notice that that early hymn or creed did not say Jesus came to die on the cross for our sins? Why did Jesus come? Do you see it there in the last line? To the glory of God the Father. So that the world might meet God and know that he is the most significant thing, person, force, anything in the whole universe. That's why Jesus came, so that the world would meet God. That's why we're disciple-making disciples, isn't it? We go, we gather, we grow, we gospel, so people can meet God. Perhaps we need another G to the glory of God himself. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Uh, Thanks for this Cook's tour. Father, we're going today, going out of this building, going home, going shopping, going. Father, help us to be intentional in our going, intentional in such a way that others meet you through Jesus Christ, know your significance and are reconciled to you. Father, we pray for those to whom we're going. We don't know who they are today. But, Father, give us those opportunities in Jesus' name. Amen. Any quick questions? Baxter. We're supposed to be going and I just said that we need to go to church.
people, we've got to go to people who are our enemies. Does that mean we can avoid people who are our it's a, it's a really good question, Baxter. So Baxter's asked a good question. If we're going to those who are our, our enemies, first one is, are they our enemies or God's enemies? They're God's enemies, aren't they? Which means they're opposed to the bloke we serve. Are, are they in all of our social networks? They are. So it doesn't mean you have to avoid your friends. You need to go to them too. But it might mean that you think about how you go to those who you don't have any connection with who might be outside your normal social class, your normal networks, your normal work environment. So it might mean, this year I'm going to join the RFS. There's a whole group of people there that I don't know. I'm going to join that. I think there was some bloke who led this church who did a lot of that, wasn't there? G'day, Tim, up the back. But thinking like that, uh, that is wise, thoughtful, intentional going. So does that answer your question? Terrific. 